I used to, when I taught, I always did the iodine clock uh, experiment with my students for the kinetics chapter. And it was like pulling teeth. I used to say, you know what, if I'd wanted to pull teeth, I would have been a dentist. I didn't, do I look like a dentist? No. <laughs> so it's a very challenging experiment for students to understand. For one thing, because they're studying rates of reaction, and they think they're studying the rate of run reaction, but really you have to tell them, well, yes, you are, but no, you are not, because you're really looking at a second reaction, and that's related to the rate of the first reaction, and at that point, trust me, you've lost them. So I want to do an iodine clock kinetics demonstration here, a classic demonstration, but I want to simplify it a little bit, and most importantly, I want to kind of do it as a challenge for the students. Um, this comes under the heading of using demonstrations to promote inquiry. I think it, it's a great way to use demonstrations. You do a demonstration, then you say something, all right, now your challenge is to make this. So what we're going to do is a demonstration looking at the iodine clock reaction, uh, the reaction of potassium iodate and sodium bisulfite. We're going to have a starch in there as the indicator for the production of iodine. Some people say iodine. I always say iodine. So, uh, so the iodine that's going to be produced. Classic, cl it's called a clock reaction, as we know, because that blue color due to the formation of iodine and the f iodine uh, starch complex basically is very sudden, and it's like an alarm clock ringing. So the demonstration utilizes three different concentrations of potassium iodate, the concentrations of sodium bisulfite, and starch and water are, will always be the same. Well, not the water, but the sodium bisulfite and the starch. So what I have pre-measured here, I'm going to do uh, three runs as part of the demonstration, and then we'll come to the challenge part. The three runs have, I've pre-measured the uh, potassium iodate and distilled water so that the total volume of this, which we'll call solution A, is always 200 milliliters. So, and I've written these on the board, or at least Scott has written these on the board, so why don't we review them just briefly. Solution A, 0.1 molar KiO3 with water. The total volume of those two is always going to be 200 milliliter. Clearly what I'm varying then is the potassium iodate concentration within solution A. We mix solution A with uh, always solution B, right? That one's easy. So solution B has sodium bisulfite, starch, and water. And again, we've got those pre-measured there in certain amounts, and those are written in the handout. And the volume of that is always going to be constant. So I'm going to uh, first dilute, and then the first one here, I've got 50 milliliters of KiO3 and 150 milliliters of water. Here we're going to pour the 50 milliliters of potassium iodate. Make sure we get about all of that. Now we're doing a kinetics demo, and so it is important here for our concentrations to be correct, so I'm trying to be as careful as I can, but you know, just the way we're doing, if this were done, you'd want to pre-measure all of these so that you're not having to measure as you're doing it. Let's just stir that. And you know what? Let's just mix all of our solutions already. In the second one, I've got 100 milliliters of potassium iodate. That way we can get these uh, graduated cylinders out of the way. And 100 milliliters of water. But I think it's important to see this so that you know, you know, I'm not making it up in terms of the amounts that we're using here. And in the last one, I've got 25 milliliters of the potassium iodate. And 175 of the water, just checking, right? Because you never know. All right, let's get those out of the way so that we can focus on the uh, beakers there. I'm going to add a stirring rod to each just so that we're doing, treating each one exactly the same. And I have three, or actually four, but measured uh, amounts. These are my solution B, remember. And this has 30, 10 milliliters of sodium bisulfite, uh, 30 milliliters of starch, and 40 milliliters of water. Those are pre-mixed. Remember what we're going to do, Scott, is as soon as I add it, you're going to start timing, right? And you're going to stop timing as soon as it turns blue. Do you have a good view from there? Okay, so as soon as I add it, you start timing. And we're waiting for the appearance of the blue color. It's not really necessary to stir. I just do it in the beginning there just to actually do everything the same. Okay, what do we have? Seconds. 11? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's put that on the board. All 
All right, and let's go to the next one. Now that had um, 50 milliliters of KiO3 and 150 milliliters of water. Uh, again, when I pour, you ready? Mm -hmm. You cleared your, <laughs> not that I don't trust you. <laughs> okay. And I think I stirred about twice or three times there. 5.7. Ooh, close. Boy, and is that good in terms of, now what would we have expected? Okay, but you know what, let's not go with what we expect. Let's do the experiment. That's always better to do the experiment first. Okay, but let's make a prediction. So I had 50 milliliters here and 150 milliliters of water. That took 11 seconds. I then doubled the concentration of the KiO3. What happened to the time? When I doubled the concentration, the time fell almost exactly in half. You're good there. Okay, so let's make the prediction then. If we, when we increase the concentration of the KiO3, the time decreased. So what would happen if we cut the concentration of KiO3 in half? The time should increase, and we would think it should double. So let's make our predictions. Well, I'm going to predict 22 seconds. Thank you. You can get it. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm counting on it as soon as I add it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, and I just to always do the same thing. I always stir that about three times. 22 seconds is a long time if nothing else is happening. Did you find that in front of your class, you know? Let's just wait a minute for this color to change. A minute, long time. Are we ready? 24. Oh. Ah. Okay. What we want to do next is plot some of this data. And as I'm plotting, though, Scott is also going to calculate one over the time. So I'm first going to plot on the, at the easel. Okay, and the reaction times. Um, we had, and I've got here on the bottom, uh, volume of KiO3, so I don't even need to calculate the concentration if I just go by volume. And the reason I can do that is because everything else was constant in all of these, the, right? And so as long as the total volume was constant, I don't need to calculate the concentration. So the first one was 50 milliliters, and that took 11 seconds. And 50 and 11 is going to be right there. Okay. And 5.7 seconds was at 100. Uh, this is exactly five, so that's six, so it's right about there. And I'm making these a little bit big because obviously I'm not using a straight edge here. And then 25 milliliters was 24 seconds. Sorry, 24 seconds is here and 25 is right in the middle there. Okay, so, hmm. Can you see those points well? Okay, we can see those points, and oh, I don't know about you, but that's not going to give a straight line no matter which way we go. So let's instead plot 1 over T versus volume. And if you can, uh, let me see. The first one had 50 milliliters and 0 0.091. 0 0.09 at 50. This is 0 0.09, 0.1, yes. So 50.09. 0.091, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and the next one had 0.18, and that was with 100. 0.18 at 100. 0 0.16, 0 0.18 is right here. And what's the last one? 25 and 0.042. 25. <laughs> this is 30, so 25 is in between, and 0.042, is that right? Mm -hmm. right. 25.042, it's going to be right about there. Ah, well, even without a straight edge, that looks a lot more like a straight line. The challenge for your students, and depending on how you're doing this, I would probably, without telling them to do this, I would just say, okay, plot both of these. Because your challenge now is to give me an iodine clock that will ring in exactly 20 seconds. Okay? So the first thing that I'm going to do is, and you wouldn't tell them anything else other than, okay, you've plotted these two things. Which one is going to give you a better way to predict a clock that will ring in exactly 20 seconds? Is that what I said? 20? No. Okay. All right. Well, let's try to draw a curve through these lines. And it's pretty easy to draw the curve through there. 
We don't know quite what it does there, but here, well, if I continue that as a smooth curve, it would go something like that, okay? This one's a little easy, and one of the reasons this is easy is that zero, zero is a point. I always love it when zero, zero is a point, so that means I can draw a line through all of those, and, and again, without a straight edge here, but honestly, that's a really good line, even without anything. Okay, so the challenge to the students, and again, you're not going to tell them this, is which plot would you use to predict how much KIO3 you have to use in order to get that clock to ring in exactly 20 seconds? Well, the good news is that exactly 20 seconds is, is on the axis here, and so we could read across 20 and then read down, and that would be 10, 20, 30, 40, I'm going to call that 33 milliliters, I, is my prediction there. But, Scott, what is 1 divided by 20? 0 .05. 0.05, okay. And so here my prediction is 33 milliliters. 0 .05 is right here, and so I'm going to follow that across. Let me just draw that line. I'm going to draw this line, too, just so you saw what I did there. That was 20 and 33. Here we're going from 0.05 down, 20, and this is 24, 28, 32, 36. 24, 28, 32, hmm. Here my prediction is almost exactly 30. So you'd ask your students if the challenge is that you have to get that clock to ring within, and you can do the challenge however you want it, half a second, a second, whatever. I would say a second is good enough. Which prediction would you make? You only get one choice. To, and then, that, then you make the students make their choice and then run it and you time them, okay? So which one do we want to use? I'm going to go for the 30 because the students would say, well, here I'm drawing a smooth curve, but I don't know exactly, you know, I don't have that many points, whereas here I've got a really good straight line. So I feel pretty confident about that. Yeah. Do you feel confident? <laughs> Do you feel lucky? <laughs> no, not lucky. Okay, so we're going to give it only one shot as if we were the students, and we said we're going to go with 30 milliliters, right? Okay, so I'm going to take, and these were used for that. I do have the pre-measured sodium bisulfite. Oh, the challenge is on. Okay, potassium iodate. We're going to use, remember, we always have 200 milliliters total of solution A. So I want 30 milliliters of the potassium iodate. And you know what, just because we can, let's, uh, let's you know, I, I want to beat the challenge here. I want to beat the clock, and I am at 30.00. Okay, that's the potassium iodate. Always good to check. And then I need 170 milliliters of water. All righty. Let's see how we do here. I'm over a little bit here. This is just water, so I'm going to lift this up. 150, 160, 170. I'm a little bit over. I want to, I want to nail this one. I'm going to take a little bit out there. Let's put that down so it's not moving. <laughs> uh, actually. All right, close enough. Let's go for that. All right, so I need to mix the potassium iodate. And the water. We were always stirring everything once. I do have a clean stirring rod here. It's glass instead of plastic. Let's hope that doesn't make a difference, right? All right, and I'm going to, when you're ready to start timing, all right, let's add solution B. I'm going to. The anticipation. Twenty point seven. <laughs> Very good. Students love a challenge. Kinetics is a difficult topic. The iodine clock reaction is a very difficult experiment for your students to do, to understand, 
doing it, not so much a problem. They don't even always understand the design of the experiment. Why did I do this here? Why is the volume, you know? You have to point those things out to them. Give them a challenge, and now they're going to want to beat that clock, and they're going to want to be sure they're as close as possible. This is a great way to use a demonstration, a classic demonstration that many people use all of the time to get them to own it, to really understand it, to look at those plots. Because, you know, if you just say, okay, well, you can plot reaction time and you can see that you get this kind of exponential curve, or you can plot 1 over t and you see, you know, and so on, and you say rates, you know. They're following all of that, but they're not really buying it because they're not invested in it. If you make them make an investment, which is a prediction, and, you know, the person that gets the closest wins, you know, a periodic table mug or something like that, you can make it fun. Uh, I'm just going to show you, just because I have it here, on the flip side of the easel, you know, you always come prepared, right? <laughs> so just in case the experiment demonstration hadn't worked, we had actually had done this in the laboratory under actual laboratory conditions, and we ran a few more points. And what you can see here is reaction time versus volume of KiO3 and then one over time. And I love this. Uh, obviously, that you, that's a real smooth curve. If you do more points, obviously, then your extrapolation is even better. Uh, in this one, this is a straight line that we have... Uh, five experimental points there. The correlation coefficient for that straight line is 0.9986. That's a straight line. The iodine clock challenge. Thank you. <laughs>